Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon Holmes. I'm a medical physicist with Standard Imaging. I'm so glad that you could join me today um, to talk about the X-ray and scintillation detectors. I'm working very hard to give you accurate measurements for your small field dosimetry. We know that's a big challenge. Make sure things are advancing. Um, just wanted to say these are some of the uh, the wonderful folks I work with at Standard Imaging and our family is very proud to be supporting you in your work in the clinic. Um, we know it's tough, uh, tough at any time, it's extra tough right now, but we are very grateful for the work that you're doing in caring for the patients um, who need your care. A little bit of housekeeping before I go too far. Um, I am recording the webinar today, so if you have to step out sometime in the middle um, and you want to see the end of it or if you want to share it with a colleague, um, you will be getting a link to that recording um, either later this afternoon or tomorrow, I would guess. If you have questions anytime during the presentation, please feel free to enter them into that GoToMeeting dialog box in the questions section, um, and I will try and answer those as I go along. If you don't know very much about us, Standard Imaging, um, just kind of as a, a little bit of history here, we are based in Middleton, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison. Um, it was founded just over... Uh, started out small um, with just a couple of products, but we have grown to the point that we design and manufacture a full suite of QA products for radiation therapy now. Um, it's a wonderful place to work, I have to admit. Um, so to go right into the topic at hand, um, I'm often asked why we went with scintillators um, for these um, small field detectors. And scintillators have been around for quite a while. Um, they are water equivalent, or they can be. Um, these organic scintillators that we're using are water equivalent for megavoltage photons and electrons, which is huge, as you know, when you get into those small field measurements. You um, don't have to correct for the beam perturbation that's happening simply by virtue of the fact that you're putting a detector in the beam if your detector really truly is water equivalent across those energy ranges. Um, so the laters can be made small so that you can get good resolution for those small fields. Um, we've not seen dose or dose rate dependencies with these detectors um, across the range of, of therapeutic dose rates um, that we use for radiotherapy. Um, the beam quality correction factor is unity, which is huge um, as you're looking um, that, that brings up um, one of them. But as energies and uh, spectra change, as you're changing your field size on these very small fields, you can no longer just use one beam quality correction factor for your, say, 6 MV beam um, because it's affected by the, the um, source obscuring and, um, and things like that as you're getting into those small fields. So having that quality correction factor be one is a very big advantage for the simulator over other detectors. There is a very small amount of temperature dependence with these detectors. Um, we see about a tenth of a percent per degree Celsius, um, which means that if you're just doing QA type measurements at room temperature, there, uh, you don't have to correct for temperature at all. Um, once we take these um, someday we'd like to take these um, into the, the patient realm and you, if you were trying to do, um, say, patient-specific point measurements on skin surfaces that were something like that, then yes, you might have to correct for the temperature dependence or do your characterization measurements at um, body temperature. But we're not FDA cleared for that yet, so um, as of right now, it should just be QA measurements, um, and as we know, our, our environments are pretty well controlled, so there isn't usually a lot of variation from day to day on the temperature in the room. The other nice thing about these is that um, the simulation fiber has no metallic parts to it at all, except for the plug at the very end, um, and so we can make them long enough to be used with the MR Linux um, and not perturb the MR field um, or cause issues um, with, um, of course, the ferrous metals in the, the MR field. Um, so they have been used with the, the MR Linux quite successfully. The Max SD, this electrometer that goes with it, um, does have to be outside the five Gauss line because of the, the components in here. 
So our scintillator is an organic scintillating material, um, depending if you're getting the W1 or um, depending which fiber for the W2 fibers you're looking at. Um, they're either one millimeter diameter and three millimeters long right now, um, or one by one, which is an option that we have available for the W2 fibers. You do, um, I guess, <laughs> Very basic construction. There's um, the scintillation or scintillator is right at the end of the fiber. Um, ionizing radiation creates visible light within that scintillator, and then that light is transferred down an optical transfer fiber. In our case, it's a PMMA fiber. So again, water equivalent. The fly in the ointment on the scintillators, and the reason that they haven't really seen much commercial use until now. Um, or until our devices really, is because they do require a correction for the Cherenkov light that's produced within that optical transfer fiber. Um, the method we use to correct for that is a two-channel chromatic correction. Um, there's a publication from Matthew Guyot et al. in MedPhysics um, from 2011. Um, that delineates that method, and that's um, exactly what we have implemented in our scintillators. The other thing about the scintillation detectors is that they're not absolute dosimeters. You cannot send them to the calibration lab to get a correlation between the light and the dose that you're measuring. Um, they do degrade with um, with radiation with age, and so you can do a, a dose or dose calibration measurement with a cross calibration or daisy chaining within your uh, institution, um, but you do need to um, refresh that periodically as it accumulates dose. These plastics, as we all know, having used uh, various clear phantoms, um, acrylic and, or PMMA does yellow with radiation, and so as you change the color of that clear plastic, it's no longer clear, it's no longer transferring the spectra exactly the way it had been previously, and so adjustments have to be made um, for that degradation and that increased attenuation of the light. The method that Guyot et al. Um, discussed in their paper, that two-channel chromatic correction, um, relies on the fact that um, the scintillator um, has kind of a sharper peak um, with the color that is generated. Um, in our case, we're using a blue scintillator. I think the, the publication actually talks about using a green scintillator, but the blue scintillator actually um, is a little bit more reliable for uh, the purposes we're using. Um, but we split the overall spectrum into two sections, the blue section and what we call the green portion of the spectrum. Um, the Cherenkov light is a broadband light, so it spans both of those. Um, but if we do a set of characterization measurements, um, one with uh, increased amount of fiber in the field, um, we call that the maximum fiber con configuration, um, and one with the fiber coming straight out of the field, we call that the minimum fiber configuration. Um, you can uh, change the shape of the spectrum by changing only the Cherenkov contribution. And so you get an increased Cherenkov contribution in both the blue and the green channels. Um, and based on the magnitude of the change relative to the other channel, we can create, create what we call a uh, Cherenkov light ratio, which is um, really just looking at the Um, with that correction factor, we can then determine from subsequent measurements, based on the amount of signal in the green channel, multiply by that Cherenkov light correction, subtract that from the blue channel, that removes this Cherenkov from the blue channel, and now you have just the simulation signal remaining. The spectrum is quite stable, and therefore we can use this in, in different levels of Cherenkov, uh, um, or with different levels of, of stem in the field, which changes your Cherenkov values um, in order to uh, accurately reproduce and reliably consistently reproduce that simulation signal. You can also do a dose calibration with the simulators. Um, this is the, the characterization and calibration slab that we provide with the W1, uh, the first generation simulator. It has a 10 by 10 field marked out. Um, and then these are the channels that are milled for the maximum fiber configuration in a 30 by 30 field and minimum fiber with the fiber coming straight out. So if you want to do a reference dose calibration, you can ensure that you're um, on the central axis in a reference field, give it a known dose, um, and then you can convert the, the simulation light into um, known doses for other field sizes for other subsequent measurements. 
So really, actually, back at these equations, it's really just a scaling factor in this equation to scale it from um, the current that we get from the optical light to the, the dose that was given. So the W1 scintillator was our first generation device. It has been on the market since 2014. Um, this is the one that has just the one by three millimeter active area available with it. Because it's been on the market for so long and because it, it was such an, an intriguing device to so many people um, in the initial years that it was out, there are quite a few publications available for that one. Um, a number of them are listed on our website. Um, one of the more recent ones that uh, to me is one of the most exciting is the joint publication from the AAPM and the IAEA on small field dosimetry, um, which is the technical report series 483 or TRS 483, shows the W1 in its uh, tables for output correction factors, um, beam quality correction factors for those small fields um, compared with other detectors. Of course, um, this happens to be the table for the 10 MV um, uh, energies. Um, and it's on the second page of that table, so we're limited on the number of detectors shown. But in every table where this scintillator shows up, every correction value, factor value is unity. Um, the values that are not shown in these tables indicate that the uncertainty um, on using that detector was too high and the group does not recommend using those detectors for those fields. Um, they could not accurately uh, determine or to the, the accuracy that they required for this publication to recommend to others to use um, the correction factors in those smaller fields. So even some other detectors that claim to be water equivalent, once you get down into these um, small field sizes and those uh, energy changes, they don't actually um, hold out as, as completely water equivalent nearly as well as the simulators do. So the W1, um, a couple limitations of it, I guess, is it is a single point measurement system. It was designed um, for uh, output factor type measurements. Um, it also um, does require a two channel electrometer to perform that Cherenkov subtraction. So our Supermax electrometer has the um, the smarts built into it to walk you through the characterization measurements, your dose calibration if you want to do that. Um, and then in the simulator mode, you can uh, choose which of those files you want to use as your calibration file, um, and it will apply those uh, corrections automatically to give you your results in terms of dose or, um, or just in terms of the, the measured current um, or charge. That's the Cherenkov corrected value, so the actual simulation measured value. Um, we also do, of course, record the raw data, so you can double check our math if you want to. Other people have done it, um, but it, it works quite well that way. You can use um, a, a different two-channel electrometer if you choose, but you do have to do all the math yourself then. So um, that, that does bring in uh, some potential for error there. The second generation device is the W2 scintillator. Um, there are actually multiple W2 type uh, W2 fibers, um, and that's because this is now user replaceable fiber. It just has an optical plug at the end, um, rather than being uh, directly connected to the, the optics. The reason we did this is because we have now uh, created what we call the Max SD. It's a dedicated optical and electronic signal processing unit to be able to take in that optical light, um, convert it to current, um, do the Cherenkov correction and dose calibration if need be, um, and then um, output the results. So you can do point measurements directly with the Max SD. The other advantage here is because we've integrated everything into one unit, um, we've improved the optics, we've decreased the electronic noise, we could go down to an option for a one by one simulator, um, not just the one by three. So now you have a uniform uh, volume integration um, no matter what the orientation of the fiber is. Also advantage with the Max SD because everything is self-contained in there um, is that it can um, take in that optical signal, do the Cherenkov correction, um, and then convert that digital value back into an analog output as a current that is sent via Triax cable to your water tank scanning electrometer. So you can put this in your water tank and actually scan with it, collect scans on your water tank electrometer. Um, the water tank treats it as it would a diode. You don't apply bias to the cable, uh, but you get current whenever there's um, 
the irradiation of the device. You have to scan slowly with it. Um, it because it's such a small device, it is a low signal device. Um, you do have to scan slowly with it, but you can get some very excellent results scanning with this uh, for small fields. There's a publication um, out of NYU Langone um, from Paulina Galavis et al that looked at the W2 compared with the W1 in terms of overall characterization, but then also looking at scanning with the W2 compared with film. Um, and so this is one of their plots for the film scans um, with the W2 measurements compared with uh, radiochromic film for a one by one field. Um, and as I mentioned, we get excellent results here. They also looked at dose rate dependence, um, looked at dose dependence and didn't see any uh, issues with those. Another interesting publication um, from uh, last year is one out from Richard Popple's group out of um, University of Alabama, Alabama, Birmingham, and they looked at patient-specific targets um, for single mats in this case, but um, looking at at patient targets down to a three millimeter diameter target um, that I believe they were treating with Varian's HyperArc system. Um, three millimeter was the smallest target they looked at and they saw very excellent agreement between the W2 and film um, for 60 patient plans for these very small targets. Um, so they now use this quite regularly for their patient specific um, and machine QA to ensure that they're um, able to, to hit these targets accurately. So that was my that was my overview. I know you guys are busy. Um, so this this is a fairly short webinar. But if you have additional questions, um, please feel free or want to learn more about either of these, please feel free to visit our website, standardimaging.com, or contact your sales rep at sales at standardimaging.com. Um, I'm also very happy to entertain questions now. If you have any um, any questions you'd like to enter into the dialog box for uh, go to meeting. There is one there. Um, what about holders for scanning? We send, uh, if you buy the W2 kit, we send it with um, an acrylic sleeve um, that has two different diameters on it, a seven millimeter diameter and an eight millimeter diameter, so that it should fit um, any of the, the standard chamber holders from any of the water tank scanning systems. Um, we've had good success with that for, um, for pretty much every vendor. I should say every vendor, not even pretty much. We've had success with it for every vendor. Um, so that that's the adapter sleeve. It, it allows you to get the scintillator a little bit further away from um, all of the, the mechanics of the scanning arm. Um, and it also allows you to, to clamp down on it with your, um, with your chamber holder to ensure it's not going to wiggle around too much um, without worrying about damaging that optical fiber. Any other questions? I would love to get some more questions. Otherwise, if you don't have questions, um, you could always contact us later if you think of something else. Um, or I will, of course, hang around and, and see if there are anything else, if there's anything else that comes up. The magnitude of the signal. Um, we're talking, oh goodness, now I'm going to say the wrong word now that I've been asked. Um, we're mostly talking picocoulomb signals here for, or uh, picoamp for currents. Um, we do put a gain on the output of the signal. Um, for the water tank so that because we know that water tank electrometers were not necessarily built to be the, um, the, the most accurate for those extremely small currents. Um, and so there is a 25 times gain that's put on the signal um, to the water tank to ensure that you get a, a reasonable signal at the water tank um, for the signal to noise and, and um, electronic noise floor limits of that particular electrometer. 
Um, has the, this been in clinical use inside patients? No, our device has not been used for patient specific measure or for during treatment patient measurements um, because we do not have regulatory clearance for that. Any, any type of use in that way would be uh, research use, off label use of our product because we don't have the regulatory clearance for that. Good question though. There's a question, what is the energy range to which it's water equivalent? Um, for all mega voltage photons and electrons, it is water equivalent. Um, if you're talking kilovoltage photons, um, now you start to get into um, some of the other photoelectric effect interactions um, dominating a little bit more or uh, fluorescence. Um, so it's, it's not water equivalent for kilovoltage energies. Um, and it's also, there are some quenching effects if you go to uh, protons. Um, but for all of the mega voltage photons and electrons, it is water equivalent. Um, could the W1 or W2 be used for low energy X-ray dosimetry? We don't have the sensitivity in our optics for that right now um, because of the signal level, the, the very small signal level that we get from KV x-rays. Um, that's not what this device was built for. That's not what it, uh, it doesn't do a very good job with that right now. Um, if there's a high uh, interest in that, then I'm sure we could work on, on a development project. But uh, so far, there hasn't been much interest. Has anyone modeled variant beam configuration using these small fields in conjunction with a standard ion chamber for larger field sizes? Um, I believe so, but I'm not sure I have the name of anyone on the tip of my tongue. I know it has been used for SRS cone commissioning um, and beam modeling, um, as well as, as small field MLC measurements, um, but I'm not sure who I could point you to um, to talk to about that. question, can we use it with the arc check? I don't know if, um, uh, I mean, there's no limitation on our end for that. I don't know um, what other competitors will drill chamber holes for, um, for some of those devices. You'd have to talk with the vendor on that one to see if they can drill for our, our detector. And then question, if we use the W2 for MR LINAC measurement, is it necessary to use magnetic correction factors to correct the reading? Um, no, you should not need to use magnetic correction factors. Um, you, If you are trying to do measurements in air, you may have some return effect that you need to worry about. Um, but as long as you're in a phantom and there aren't any air gaps around it, there should be no need for a, an MR correction. There is a little bit of dependency, um, the Cherenkov dependency uh, based on the direction of the MR field. So you want to be consistent with your orientation between your characterization and your, um, your output measurements. Because of the way Cherenkov is produced by the electrons that are traveling through the medium, um, it has a of the electrons. And so you may see some differences in the Cherenkov spectrum based on the orientation of your fiber within the MR field. It's not huge, but it is it is a potential issue. So the, the best thing to do in, um, in the MR LINAC is just to be sure that you're consistent with your setup uh, in terms of the orientation of the fiber. Thanks so much, everyone. These are excellent questions. Any more questions, please feel free to answer. Otherwise, thanks once again. We do really appreciate your time today.